While Hall examined the old man and the baby, Stone and Levitt remained in the main control room. Stone opened the mechanical hands while Levitt manipulated the microscopic apparatus. Stone positioned the capsule and pressed the appropriate controls. A black box moved down from the ceiling and began to scan the capsule surface. The two men watched the viewer screens. Start with five power, Stone said. Levitt set the controls. They watched as the viewer automatically moved around the capsule, focusing on the surface of the metal. They watched one complete scan, then shifted up to 20 power magnification. A 20 power scan took much longer since the field of view was smaller. They still saw nothing on the surface. No punctures, no indentations, nothing that looked like a small growth of any kind. Let's go to 100, Stone said. Levitt adjusted the controls and sat back. They were beginning what they knew would be a long and tedious search. Probably they would find nothing. Soon they would examine the interior of the capsule. They might find something there, or they might not. In either case, they would take samples for analysis, plating out the scrapings and swabs onto growth media. Three scans at 5, 20, and 100 power took them slightly more than two hours. At the end of the third scan, Stone said, I suppose we ought to proceed with the 440 scan as well, but I'm tempted to go directly to a scan of the interior. If we find nothing, we can come back outside and do a 440. I agree. Then they did a five-power scan of the interior. They found nothing except a small indentation the size of a pencil point. At Stone's suggestion, when they began the 20-power scan, they started with the indentation. Immediately they saw it. A tiny black fleck of jagged material, no larger than a grain of sand. There seemed to be bits of green mixed in with the black. Keep Neither man reacted, though Levitt later recalled left. that he was trembling with excitement. I kept thinking, if this is turn it, left. if it's really something new, some brand new form of life. At a higher magnification, it appeared no different from their earlier views, only larger. They could see, however, that it was an irregular piece of material, dull, looking like rock. And they could see there were definitely flecks of green mined on the jagged surface of the material. What do you make of it? Stone said. If that's the object the capsule collided with, Levitt said. It was either moving with great speed or else it is very heavy because it's not big enough to knock the satellite out of orbit otherwise, I agree. And yet it did make a very deep indentation, suggesting... Stone shrugged. Suggesting that it was either not responsible for the orbital change or that it has some elastic properties we don't yet know about. At a magnification of 440, the surface irregularities of the rock were striking. It was like a miniature planet with jagged peaks and sharp valleys. That left Get ready to turn there. left. Stone pointed to the screen. The surface of the stone, if it is a stone, is rough everywhere except on that left border, where it is smooth and rather straight. Turn left. Like an artificial surface. Stone sighed. If I keep looking at it, I might start to think so. Let's see those other patches of green. Levitt set the coordinates and focused the viewer. A new image appeared on the screens. This time it was a close-up of one of the green patches. Under high magnification, the borders could be seen clearly. They were not smooth, but slightly notched. They looked almost like a gear from the inside of a watch. I'll be damned, Levitt said. As they watched, it happened. The green spot turned purple for a fraction of a second, less than the blink of an eye. Then it turned green once more. Did you see that? I saw it. You didn't change the lighting? No, didn't touch it. And then, as they watched, the spot turned purple and remained purple. The notches disappeared. The spot had are. enlarged slightly, Safe and sound. filling in the V-shaped gaps. It was now a complete circle. It became green once more. It's growing, Stone said. Burton was working in the autopsy room. He was nervous and tense, still bothered by his memories of Piedmont. Weeks later, in reviewing his work and his thoughts on level five, he regretted his inability to concentrate. Because in his initial series of experiments, Burton had made several mistakes. According to the protocol, he was required to carry out autopsies on dead animals but he Let's was also this. in charge of preliminary vector experiments. They were reasonably simple and straightforward, designed to answer the question of how the disease was transmitted. Burton began with a series of cages lined up in a row. 
Each had a separate air supply. The air supplies could be interconnected in a variety of ways. Burton placed the corpse of the dead Norway rat, which was contained in an airtight cage, alongside another cage containing a living rat. He punched buttons. Air was allowed to pass freely from one cage to the other. The living rat flopped over and died. Interesting, he thought. Airborne transmission. He hooked up a second cage with a live rat, but inserted a millipore filter between the living and dead rat cages. This filter had perforations 100 angstroms in diameter, the size of a small virus. Get ready to turn he opened left. the passage between the two cages. The rat remained alive. He watched turn for left. several moments until he was satisfied. Whatever it was that transmitted the disease, it was larger than a virus. He changed the filter, replacing it with a larger one, and then another still larger. He continued in this way until the rat died. Yet clearly no gas was responsible. The disease was transmitted by something the size of a cell. It was very much bigger than a molecule or gas droplet. The next step was equally simple, to determine whether dead animals were potentially infectious. He took one of the dead rats and pumped the air out of its cage. He waited until the air was fully evacuated. In the pressure fall, the rat ruptured, bursting open. Burton ignored this. When he was sure all air was removed, he replaced the air with fresh, clean, filtered air. Then he connected the cage to the cage of a living animal. Nothing happened. The live rat scampered about its cage happily. The results were quite clear. Dead animals were not infectious. That was why he thought the buzzards could chew at the Piedmont victims and not die. Corpses could not transmit the disease. Only the bugs themselves, carried in the air, could do so. Most people, when they thought of bacteria, thought of diseases. Yet the fact was that only 3% of bacteria produced human disease. The rest were either harmless or beneficial. In the human gut, for instance, there were a variety of bacteria that were helpful to the digestive process. Man needed them and relied upon them. In fact, man lived in a sea of bacteria. They were everywhere, on his skin, in his ears and mouth, down in his lungs, in his stomach. Everything he owned, anything he touched, every breath he breathed, was drenched in bacteria. Bacteria was ubiquitous. Most of the time you weren't aware of it. Go straight on. And there was a reason. Both man and bacteria had gotten used to each other, had developed a kind of mutual immunity, each adapted to the other. And this in turn for a very good reason. It was a principle of biology that evolution was directed toward increased reproductive potential. A man easily killed by bacteria Go was poorly on. adapted. He didn't live long enough to reproduce. A bacteria that killed its host was also poorly adapted because any parasite that kills its host is a failure. It must die when the host dies. The successful parasites were those that could live off the host without killing him. And the most successful hosts were those that could tolerate the parasite or even turn it to advantage to make it work for the host. The best adapted bacteria, Burton used to say, are the ones that cause minor diseases or none at all. You may carry the same single cell of strep viridians on your body for 60 or 70 years, and during that time you are growing and reproducing happily, and of course so is the strep. You can carry strep aureus around and pay only the price of some acne and pimples. You can carry tuberculosis for many decades. You can carry syphilis for a lifetime. These last are not minor diseases, but they are much less severe than they once were because both man and organism have adapted. It was known, for instance, that syphilis had been a virulent disease 400 years before, producing huge festering sores all over the body, often killing in weeks. But over the centuries, Man and the spirochete had learned to tolerate each other. Such considerations were not so abstract and academic as they seemed at first. In the early planning of wildfire, Stone had observed that 40% of all human disease was called by microorganisms. Burton had countered by noting that only 3% of all microorganisms caused disease. Obviously, while much human misery was attributable to bacteria, the chances of any particular bacteria being dangerous to man were very small. This was because the process of adaptation of fitting man to bacteria was complex. Most bacteria, 
Burton once observed, simply can't live within a man long enough to harm him. Conditions are one way or another unfavorable. The body is too hot or too cold, too acid or too alkaline, or there is just too much oxygen or not enough. Man's body is as hostile as Antarctica to most bacteria. Burton already knew something about transmission and something about the mechanism of death. Clotting of the blood. The question remained, how did the organism get into the body? He knew that the organism killed by clotting blood. Very likely, it would initiate clotting at the point of entrance into the body. If skin, clotting would start near the surface. If lungs, it would begin in the chest, radiating outward. This was something he could test. By using radioactively tagged blood proteins and then following his animals with scintillometer scans, he could determine where in the body the blood first clotted. The scanner would print out its results on a series of block outlines on which were patterns of dots in the shape of a human body. He set the computer printing program and then exposed a rhesus monkey to air containing the lethal microorganism. Immediately, the printout began to clatter out from the computer. The graphic printout told him what he needed to know, that clotting began in the lungs and spread outward through the rest of the body. But there was an additional piece of information gained. Burton later said, It seemed impossible to me that death could occur in three seconds, but it seemed even more unlikely that the total blood volume of the body, five quarts, could solidify in so short a period. I was curious to know whether a single crucial clot might form in the brain, perhaps, and that the rest of the body clot at a slower pace. Burton was thinking of the brain, even at this early stage of his investigation. In retrospect, it is frustrating that he did not follow this line of inquiry to its logical conclusion. He was prevented from doing this by the evidence of the scans, which told him that clotting began in the lungs and progressed up the carotid arteries to the brain one or two seconds later. So Burton lost immediate interest in the brain. His mistake was compounded by his next experiment. It was a simple test, not part of the regular wildfire protocol. Burton knew that death coincided with blood clotting. If clotting could be prevented, could death be avoided? He took several rats and injected them with heparin, an anticoagulating drug preventing blood clot formation. Then he exposed the rats to air containing the lethal organism. The first rat with a low dose died in five seconds. The others followed within a minute. A single rat with a massive dose lived nearly three minutes, but he also succumbed in the end. Burton was depressed by the results. Although death was delayed, it was not prevented. The method of symptomatic treatment did not work. He put the dead rats to one side, then made his crucial mistake. Burton did not autopsy the anticoagulated rats. Instead, he turned his attention to the original autopsy specimens, the first black Norway rat and the first rhesus monkey to be exposed to the capsule. To gross inspection, the animals had died of total intravascular coagulation. The arteries, the heart, lungs, kidneys, liver, and spleen, all the blood-containing organs were rock-hard solid. This was what he had expected. Burton shook his head. Anticoagulants might not work, but the fact was that something stopped the process. There was a way that it could be done. He knew that, because Keep two people right. had survived. At 11.47 hours, Mark Hall was bent over the computer, staring at the console that showed the laboratory results from his examination of Peter Jackson and the infant. The infant, Hall observed, was normal. However, Peter Jackson was another problem entirely. Jackson had been anemic for some time. He showed immature red cell forms, which meant that his body was struggling to replace lost blood and so had to put young, immature red cells into circulation. The tests also indicated that while Jackson was bleeding from somewhere in his gastrointestinal tract, he had no primary bleeding problem. Go his straight blood on. clotted normally. The pH of the blood was a bit of a puzzle. At 7.31, it was too acid, though not strikingly so. Hall was at a loss to explain this, so was the computer. 
which printed out the message that a further patient history would be appropriate. Paul returned to the room where the two patients were lying. He crawled down the tunnel and then stood up inside the suit. Then he could work with the patients inside the room. Jackson was stirring sleepily. Mr. Jackson, wake up. Go Slowly he on. opened his eyes and stared at Hall. He blinked, not believing. Don't be frightened, Hall said quietly. I'm Dr. Hall. I've been taking care of you. You were bleeding very badly. We had to give you a transfusion. Jackson nodded, accepting this quite calmly. Then, I want a cigarette. I'm sorry, smoking's not allowed. Look here, young fella. When you lived as long as I, uh, you know what you can do and what you can't do. They told Keep me left. before, and then no that Mexican left. food, no liquor, no butts. Well, I tried for us, Bill. Turn you left. know how that makes a body feel? Terrible. Just terrible. Who told you? Those doctors in Phoenix. Big fancy hospital. Go straight on. Why did you go to the hospital? Why does anybody go to the hospital? I was sick, damn it. What was your problem, Mr. Jackson? This damn stomach of mine. Same as always. Bleeding? Christ! Bleeding? Every time I hiccup, I came up with blood. They gave me this milk stuff. Tasted like chalk. But I found a better thing for the pain. What was that? Aspirin, Jackson said. Didn't anybody tell you aspirin would make the bleeding worse? Sure, Jackson said. They told me. But I didn't mind none, because... Stop the pain, Go straight see? on. That plus a little squeeze. Squeeze? Sterno. Pink lady. Aspirin and squeeze, see? Really kills that pain. Did this aspirin and squeeze have any effect on you, on your breathing? Well, now you mention it, I was a tad short of breath. What, what the hell? I don't need much breath at my age. <laughs> Jackson yawned and closed his eyes. In Delta Sector, the computers hummed and clicked softly as Captain Arthur Morris punched through a new program on the console. Captain Morris was a programmer. He'd been sent to Delta Sector by the command on Level 1 because no messages had been received for nine hours. It was possible, of course, that there had been no priority transmissions, but it was also unlikely. And if there had been unreceived messages, then the computers were not functioning properly. Captain Morris watched as the computer ran its usual internal check program, which read out as all circuits functioning. The teleprinter typed, machine function on all circuits. He looked and nodded, satisfied. He could not have known, as he stood before the teleprinter, that there was indeed a fault, but that it was purely mechanical, not electronic, and hence could not be tested on the check programs. The fault lay within the teleprinter box itself. There, a sliver of paper from the edge of the roll had peeled away and curling upward had lodged between the bell and striker, preventing the bell from ringing. It was for this reason that no transmissions had been recorded. Neither machine nor man was able to catch the error. According to protocol, the team met every 12 hours for a brief conference, at which results were summarized and new directions planned. In order to save time, the conferences were held in a small room off the cafeteria. They could eat and talk at the same time. First, Burton told them about the autopsies. When it was Hall's turn, he described Jackson's condition and his self-prescribed treatment. A bottle of aspirin a day and some sterno on top of it. He says this left him a little short of breath. And made him acidotic as hell, Burton said. Exactly, Hall said. Methanol, when broken down by the body, was converted to formaldehyde and formic acid. In combination with aspirin, it meant Jackson was consuming great quantities of acid. The body had to maintain its acid-based balance within fairly narrow limits or death would occur. One way to keep the balance was to breathe rapidly and blow off carbon dioxide, decreasing carbonic acid in the body. Stone said, could this acid have protected him from the organism? Hall shrugged, impossible to say. Burton said to Stone, 
And what have you found in the capsule? We'd better show you, Stone said. The door said morphology. Inside, the room was partitioned into a place for the experimenters to stand and a glass-walled isolation chamber further in. Gloves were provided so the men could reach into the chamber and move instruments about. Stone pointed to a glass dish and a small fleck of black inside it. Ten power, Levitt said. On the screen, Hall saw that the rock was jagged, blackish, dull. Stone pointed out green flecks. One hundred power, Levitt said. The green flecks were larger now, very clear. We think that's our organism. We've observed it growing, Stone said. As they watched, the spot turned purple and green again. It's dividing now, Stone said. Excellent. Levitt switched on the cameras. Now watch closely. The spot turned purple and held the color. It seemed to expand slightly, and for a moment the surface broke into fragments, hexagonal in shape like a tile floor. Did you see that? It seemed to break up into a six-sided figures. I wonder, Stone said, whether those figures represent single units, or whether they're regular geometric shapes all the time, or just during division, Levitt said. We'll know more, Stone said, after the EM. Arthur Manchek had just finished dinner when he received the call about the routine training mission crash. Sir, Colonel Burns said, Phantom drifted off its flight plan 40 minutes out of San Francisco and passed through Area WF. Area WF was the designation for the cordoned off radius around Piedmont, Arizona. They should have dropped the bomb, Manchek thought. They should have dropped it two days ago. At the time of the decision to delay Directive 712, Manchek had been uneasy. But officially, he could not express an opinion. And he had waited in vain for the wildfire team, on. now located in the underground laboratory, to complain to Washington. He knew wildfire had been notified. He had seen the cable that went to all security units. It was quite explicit. Yet, for some reason, wildfire had not complained. Indeed, they paid no attention to it whatever. Very odd. And now there was a crash. This is movie country, somebody said looking at the sandstone cliffs, the brilliant reddish hues against the deepening blue of the sky. And it was true. Many movies had been filmed in this area of Utah. But Manchek could not think of movies now. As he sat in the back of the limousine moving away from the Utah airport, he considered what he had been told. During the flight from Vandenberg to southern Utah, the post team had heard transcripts of the flight transmission between the Phantom and Topeka Central. For the most part, it was dull, except for the final moments before the pilot crashed. The pilot had said, Something's wrong! Something's wrong! And then a moment later, My rubber air hose is dissolving! Must be the vibration! It's just disintegrating the dust! Perhaps ten seconds after that, a weak, fading voice said, Everything made of rubber in the cockpit's dissolving! There were no further transmissions. There's the wreck, somebody said, up ahead. The wreckage of the Phantom was scattered over two square miles of desert. Standing next to the charred remnants of the left wing, Manchek could barely see the others on the horizon near the right wing. Everywhere he looked, there were bits of twisted metal, blackened, paint peeling. As the sun faded, he found himself standing near the remains of the tail section, where the metal still radiated heat from the smoldering fire. Half buried in the sand, he saw a bit of bone. He picked it up and realized with horror that it was human. Long and broken, and charred at one end, it had obviously come from an arm or a leg. But it was oddly clean. There Never was no mind. flesh remaining, I'll find only a smooth new bone. It was late in the evening when a biochemist came up to talk with him. You know, the biochemist said, it's funny. That transcript about the rubber in the cockpit dissolving? How do you mean? Well, no rubber was used in this airplane. It was all synthetic plastic compounds. Newly developed by Ancro, they're quite proud of it. It's a polymer that has some of the same characteristics as human tissue. Very flexible, lots of applications. Manchek said, You think vibrations could have caused the disintegration? No, the man said. There are thousands of phantoms flying around the world. They all have this plastic. None of them has ever had this trouble. Slowly, 
the wildfire installation settled into a routine, a rhythm of work in the underground chambers of a laboratory where there was no night or day, morning or afternoon. The men slept when they were tired, awoke when they were refreshed, and carried on their work in a number of different areas. Burton stood in the room that housed the spectrometer, along with several other pieces of equipment for radioactivity assays, ratio density, photometry, thermocoupling analysis, and preparation for X-ray crystallography. The spectrometer employed in level five was the standard Whittington model K5. Essentially, it consisted of a vaporizer, a prism, and a recording screen. The material to be tested was set in the vaporizer and burned. The light from its burning then user. passed through the prism, where it was broken down to a spectrum that was projected onto a recording screen. Since Turn different left. elements gave off different wavelengths of light as they burned, it was possible to analyze the chemical makeup of a substance by analyzing the spectrum of light produced. Burton placed the first chip from the black rock onto the vaporizer and pressed the button. There was a single bright burst of intensely hot light. He turned away, avoiding the brightness, and then he put the second chip onto the lamp. Already he knew the computer was analyzing the light from the first chip. In another room, Levitt was carefully feeding similar chips into a different machine, an amino acid analyzer. Amino acids were the building blocks of protein. There were 24 known amino acids, each composed of a half dozen molecules left, of carbon, and then hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Proteins were made by stringing these amino acids together in a line, like a freight train. Turn left. The order of stringing determined the nature of the protein. It was a shot in the dark, this machine, because they had no reason to believe Goes that the rock or the green organism was composed even partially of proteins. True, every living thing on Earth had at least some proteins, but that didn't mean life elsewhere had to have it. Biology, as the Nobel Prize winning scientist Keep George right. Walt had said, was a unique science because it could not define its subject matter. Nobody had a definition for life. Nobody knew what it was, really. The old definitions, an organism that showed ingestion, excretion, metabolism, reproduction, and so on, were worthless. One could always find exceptions. The wildfire group had concluded that energy conversion was the hallmark of life. All living organisms in some way took in energy, as food or sunlight, and converted it to another form of energy and put it to use. Viruses were the exception to this rule, but the group was prepared to define viruses as non-living. For one of the group's meetings, Levitt was asked to prepare a rebuttal to the definition. He pondered it and returned with three objects, a swatch of black cloth, a watch, and a piece of granite. Go straight he on. set them down before the group and said, gentlemen, I give you three living things. He then challenged the team to prove that they were not living. He placed the black cloth in the sunlight. It became warm. This, he announced, was an example of energy conversion, radiant energy to heat. It was objected that this was merely passive energy absorption, not conversion. It was also objected that the conversion, if it could be called that, was not purposeful. It served no function. How do you know it's not purposeful, Levitt had demanded. Then they turned to the watch. Levitt pointed to the radium dial which glowed in the dark. Decay was taking place and light was being produced. The men argued that this was merely a release of potential energy held in unstable electron levels. But there was growing confusion. Levitt was making his point. Finally, they came to the granite. This is a lie, Levitt said. It's living, breathing, walking, and talking. Only we cannot see it because it's happening too slowly. A rock has a lifespan of three billion years. We have a lifespan of 60 or 70 years. We cannot see what is happening to this rock. The same reason that we cannot make out the tune on a record being played at the rate of one revolution every century. And the rock, for its part, is not even aware of our existence because we are alive for only a brief instance of its lifespan. To it, we are like flashes in the dark. He held up his watch. His point was clear enough, and they revised their thinking in one important respect. They conceded that it was possible that they might not be able to analyze certain life forms. It was possible 
that they might not be able to make the slightest headway, the least beginning, in such an analysis. Jeremy Stone, working with infinite patience, took a flake of the green material and dropped it into molten plastic. The plastic was the size and shape of a medicine capsule. He waited until the flake was firmly embedded and poured more plastic over it. He then transferred the plastic pill to the curing room. Stone envied the others their mechanized routines. The preparation of samples for electron microscopy was still a delicate task requiring skilled human hands. Once the plastic hardened, he would scrape it away and then flake off a small bit of green with a microtome. This would go into the electron microscope. The flake would have to be of the right thickness and size, a small round shaving, 1.500 angstroms in depth, no more. Only then could he look at the green stuff, whatever it was, at 60,000 diameters magnification. That, he thought, would be interesting. In general, Stone believed the work was going well. They are making fine progress, moving forward in several promising lines of inquiry. But most important, they had time. There was no rush, no panic, no need to fear. The bomb had been dropped on Piedmont. That would destroy airborne organisms and neutralize the source of infection. Wildfire was the only place that any further infection could spread from, and wildfire was specifically designed to prevent that. Should isolation be broken in the lab, the areas that were contaminated would automatically seal off. At wildfire, they were prepared for that eventuality. Keep right. But if it did not happen, and the odds were that it would not, then they would work safely here for an indefinite period. There was no problem, no problem at all. Paul walked through the corridor looking at the atomic detonator substations. He was trying to memorize their positions. There were five on the floor positioned at intervals along the central corridor. Each was the same. Small silver boxes, no larger than a cigarette packet. Each had a lock for the key, a green light that was burning, and a dark red light. Burton had explained the mechanism earlier. There are sensors in all the duct systems and in all the labs. They monitor the air in the rooms by a variety of chemical, electronic, and straight bioassay devices. The bioassay is just a mouse whose heartbeat is being monitored. If anything goes Get wrong with the sensors, the lab left. automatically seals off. If the whole floor is contaminated, it will seal off and the atomic device will cut in. When that happens, Turn left. the green light will go out and the red light will begin to blink. That signals the start of the three-minute interval. Unless you lock in your key, the bomb will go off at the end of three minutes. So I'm really the only one, Hall said? You really are. And you only have one key. But there's a complicated problem. The blueprints weren't followed exactly. We've only discovered the error after the lab was Keep finished right, and the device and was then installed. Turn right. But there is an error. We are short three detonator substations. There are only five instead of eight. Turn right. Meaning, Hall said? Meaning that if the floor starts to contaminate, you must rush to locate yourself at a substation. Keep left. Otherwise, there's a chance you can be left. sealed off in a sector without a substation, and then in the event of a malfunction turn of the left. bacteriologic sensors, a false positive malfunction, the laboratory could be destroyed okay. needlessly. Let's find a new route. That seems a rather serious error in planning, Hall said. It turns out that three new Keep substations left. were going and to be added next left. month, but that won't help us now. Just keep the problem in mind and everything will be all right. Turn left. Levitt awoke quickly, Get ready rolling to out turn of bed right. and starting to dress. He was excited. He just had an idea. A fascinating thing. Turn right. Wild, crazy, but fascinating as hell. It had come from his dream. He had been dreaming of a house, and then of a city. A huge, complex, interconnecting city around the house. A man lived in the house with his family. The man lived and worked and commuted within the city, moving about, acting, reacting. And then in the dream, the city was suddenly eliminated, Keep leaving right, only the house. And then turn right. How different things were then. The house became a different organism altogether. And from that to turn the wildfire right. organism was but a single step, a single leap of the imagination. 
Well, Stone would at least be interested. He glanced at the clock. 2,200 hours, getting on toward midnight. He hurried to dress. He took out a new paper suit and slipped his feet in. The paper was cool against his bare flesh. And then suddenly it was warm. A strange sensation. He finished dressing, stood and zipped up the one-piece suit. As he left, he looked once again at the clock. 2210. Oh Christ, he thought. It had happened again. And this time for ten minutes. What had gone on? He couldn't remember. But it was ten minutes gone disappeared while he had dressed, an action that shouldn't have taken more than 30 seconds. It was terrifying. For a moment he considered telling the others, then shook his head. He'd be all right. It wouldn't happen again. He was going to be just fine. He stood. He'd been on his way to see Stone to talk to Stone about something, something important and exciting. He paused. He couldn't remember. The idea, the image, the excitement was gone, vanished, erased from his mind. They met again at midnight in the same room in the same way. Stone glanced at the others and saw that they were tired. No one, including himself, was getting enough sleep. We're going at this too hard, he said. We don't need to work around the clock and we shouldn't do so. Tired men will make mistakes. The team agreed to get at least six hours sleep in each 24-hour period. That seemed reasonable, since there were no problem on the surface, the infection at Piedmont had been halted by the atomic bomb. Their belief might never have been altered had not Levitt suggested that they file for a code name. Levitt stated that they had an organism and that it required a code. The others agreed. In a corner of the room stood the scrambler typewriter. It had been clattering all day long, typing out material sent in from the outside. No one had really bothered to look at the input since their arrival on level five. They were all too busy. Besides, most of the input had been routine military dispatches that were sent to wildfire but did not concern it. Stone went to the typewriter and printed out his message. There followed a long pause. The scrambler telephone hummed and clicked but printed nothing. Then the typewriter began to spit out a message on a long roll of paper. Opening new category classification according to ICDA standard reference code for your organism will be Andromeda code will read out Andromeda strain. Stone type back. Understand coding as Andromeda strain. Accepted. End message. Transmitted. Well, Stone said that's that. Burton had been looking over the sheaves of paper behind the teleprinter. The teleprinter wrote its messages out on a long roll of paper which fell into a box. There were dozens of yards of paper that no one had looked at. Silently, he read a single message, tore it from the rest of the strip, and handed it to Stone. Transmit to all stations, classification top secret, request for directive 712 received, authority primary mancheck Arthur Major USA in closed session, this directive has not been acted upon. Final decision has been postponed 24 to 48 hours. Alternative troop deployment according to Directive 711 now in effect. The team stared at the message in disbelief. No one said anything for a long time. Get Sector 5 on the intercom, Stone said. Ten minutes later, the horrified Captain Morris had connected Stone to Robertson, the head of the President's Science Advisory Committee, who was in Houston. There then followed a heated discussion of the President's decision not to call a Directive 712. The President doesn't trust scientists, Robertson said. He doesn't feel comfortable with them. It's your job to make him comfortable, Stone said, and you haven't been doing it. Jeremy, I agree the bomb should have been dropped. Then work on him. Stay on his back. Get him to call a 712 as soon as possible. It may already be too late. Robertson said he would and would call back. Before he hung up, he said, By the way, any thoughts about the Phantom? The what? Stone said. The Phantom that crashed in Utah. There was a moment of confusion before the wildfire group understood that they had missed still another important teleprinter message. Robertson explained what had happened. We're waiting for information from them. It could come at any time. Pass it along, Stone said, and then he stopped. If a 7-Eleven was ordered instead of a 7-12, he said, then you have troops in the area around Piedmont? 
National Guard, yes. That's pretty damn stupid, Stone said. Look, Jeremy, I agree. When the first one dies, Stone said, I want to know when and how, and most especially where. The wind there is from the east predominantly. If you start losing men west of Piedmont, I'll call, Jeremy, Robertson said. The conversation ended, and the team shuffled out of the conference room. Hall remained behind a moment, going through some of the rolls in the box, noting the messages. The majority were unintelligible to him, a weird set of nonsense messages and codes. After a time, he gave up. He did so before he came upon the reprinted news item concerning the peculiar death of Officer Martin Willis of the Arizona Highway Patrol. With the new pressures of time, the results of spectrometry and the amino acid analysis, previously of peripheral interest, suddenly became matters of major concern. It was hoped that these analyses would tell, in a rough way, how foreign the Andromeda organism was to Earth life forms. It was thus with interest that Levitt and Burton looked over the computer printout, a column of figures written on green paper. What all the data meant was simple enough. The black rock contained hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen with significant amounts of sulfur, silicon, and selenium, and with trace quantities of several other elements. The green spot, on the other hand, contained hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. Keep left. Nothing else at all. The two men found it peculiar that the rock and the green spot should be so similar in chemical makeup. And it was peculiar that the green spot should contain nitrogen, while the rock contained none at all. The conclusion was obvious. The black rock was not rock at all, but some kind of material similar to earthly organic life. It was something akin to plastic. And the green spot, presumably alive, was composed of elements in roughly the same proportion as earth life. However, it contained no amino acids. No amino acids, Burton said. No proteins. Life without proteins, Levitt said. They were dealing with an entirely alien organism. In the room marked morphology, Jeremy Stone removed the small plastic capsule in which the green fleck had been embedded. He set the now hard capsule into a vise fixing it firmly, and then took a dental drill to it, shaving away the plastic until he had a pyramid of plastic with the green fleck at the peak of the pyramid. Keep left. He unscrewed the vise and lifted the plastic out. He took it to the microtome, a knife with a revolving blade that cut very thin slices of plastic and embedded green tissue. This he inserted into the electron microscope. In principle, the electron microscope worked exactly like a light microscope, but instead of focusing light rays, it focused an electron beam. Light is focused by lenses of curved glass. Electrons are focused by magnetic fields. Stone turned down the room lights and clicked on the beam. He adjusted several dials to focus the beam. In a moment, the image came into focus, green and black on the screen. It was incredible. Jeremy Stone found himself staring at a single unit of the organism. It was a perfect, six-sided hexagon, and it interlocked with other hexagons on each side. The interior of the hexagon was divided into wedges, each meeting at the precise center of the structure. The overall appearance was accurate, with a kind of mathematical precision he did not associate with life on Earth. It looked like a crystal. He decided to call Levitt in. As soon as he arrived, Levitt said, Well... There's one answer. Answer to what, Stone said. To how this organism functions. Or I've seen the results of spectrometry and amino acid analysis. And? The organism is made of hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen. But it has no amino acids at all. None. Which means that it has no proteins as we know them and no enzymes. I was wondering how we could survive without protein-based organization. Now I know. The crystalline structure. Looks like it, Levitt said, peering at the screen. He frowned. Something the matter, Stone asked? Levitt was thinking, remembering something he had forgotten. A dream about a house and a city. He thought for a moment, and it began to come back to him. A house and a city. The way the house worked alone, and the way it worked in a city. It all came back. You know, he said, it's interesting. 
why this one unit interlocks with the others around it. You're wondering if we're seeing part of a higher organism, Stone asked? Exactly. Is this unit self-sufficient like a bacterium, or is it just a block from a larger organ or a larger organism? After all, if you saw a single liver cell, could you guess what kind of organ it came from? No. And what good would one brain cell be without the rest of the brain? Stone stared at the screen for a long time. A rather unusual pair of analogies, because the liver can regenerate, can grow back, but the brain cannot. Levitt smiled. The messenger theory. The messenger theory had come from John R. Samuels, a communications engineer. He had reviewed some theories about the way in which an alien culture might choose to contact other cultures. He argued that the most advanced concepts and communications in Earth technology were inadequate, and that the advanced cultures would find better methods. Let us say a culture wishes to scan the universe, he said. Let us say they wish to have a sort of um, coming-out party on a galactic scale to formally announce their existence. They wish to spew out information, clues to their existence in every direction. Well, what is the best way to do this? Radio? Hardly. Radio is much too slow, too expensive, and it decays too rapidly. You do not use physics to carry your message. You use biology. You create a communication system that does not diminish with distance, but rather remains as powerful a million miles away as it was at the source. In short, you devise an organism to carry your message. The organism would be self-replicating, cheap, and could be produced in fantastic numbers. For a few dollars, you could produce trillions of them and send them off in all directions into space. They would be tough, hearty bugs, able to withstand the rigors of space, and they would grow and duplicate and divide. Within a few years, there would be countless numbers of these in the galaxy. Each single organism would carry the potential to develop into a full organ, or a full organism. They would, upon contacting life, begin to grow into a complete communicating mechanism. It's a bit like spewing out a billion brain cells, each capable of regrowing a complete brain under the proper circumstances. The newly grown brain would then speak to the new culture informing them of the presence of the others and announcing ways in which contact might be made. Samuel's theory of the messenger bug could not be discounted now. Perhaps the cultures will tell us more, Levitt said. Or X-ray crystallography, Stone said. I'll order it now. X-ray crystallography could outline individual molecules. It came as close to photographing atoms as science could manage. But the device was the size of a large automobile, filled an entire room required specially trained operators and demanded a computer for interpretation of results. It produced a diffraction pattern instead of an image. This appeared as a pattern of geometric dots, in itself rather mysterious on a photographic plate. By using a computer, the pattern of dots could be analyzed and the structure deduced. How are you feeling, Mr. Jackson? Hall asked. The old man blinked his eyes and looked at Hall in his plastic suit. All right. Not the best, but all right. He gave a wry grin. Up to talking a little? Uh, about what? Piedmont. What about it? That night, Hall said, the night it all happened. They all died, did they? <laughs> Not all. One other survived. Hall nodded to the crib next to Jackson. Jackson peered over at the bundle of blankets. Who's that? A baby. Baby? Mm, must be the Ritter child. Jamie Ritter. A real little heller. Just like the old man. Old Ritter likes to kick up a storm and his kids the same way. Squall and morning, <laughs> noon and night. Uh, I remember he was squalling like the dickens that night. What night? Uh, the night Charlie Thomas brought the damn thing in. <laughs> We all seen it, of course. Came down like one of them shooting stars, all glowing, and landed just to the north. Everybody was excited. Charlie Thomas went off to get it. And then what happened? Well, we all gathered around, looking at it. I reckon it must be one of them space things. And Charlie says, let's give it to Doc. That's Doc Benedict. He's the town doctor. Yeah. It was about eight. 
8.30 and it all started up, you see. I was already at the gas station, having a chat with Al, who was working at the pump that night. Suddenly he shouts, Oh God, my head! Yeah, he runs up outside and falls down right there in the street. Not a word from him. And, and they all start coming out. I believe Mrs. Langdon, the widow Langdon, was next. After that, I don't want to go. There were so many of them. Just pouring outside, it seemed like. And, and they just grabbed her chest and fall like they slipped. <coughs> Heard the baby crying, so I knew not everybody could be dead. And then I saw the general. The general? Eh, we just called him that. He was no general. Just been in the war and liked to be remembered. Older than me he is. Nice fella. Peter Arnold. Steady as a rock all his life. And he's standing by the porch hall, got up in his military clothes. And he says, what the hell's happening? Jap's coming in? So I says, Peter, you going loco? And he says he don't feel too good. And he goes inside. Of course, he must have gone loco because he shot himself. But others went loco too. <sighs> it was a disease. How do you know, I'll ask. People don't burn themselves or drown themselves if they got sense, do they? All them in that town were good, normal folks until that night. And they just seemed to go crazy. And what did you do? Yeah. I thought to myself, Peter, you're dreaming. You had too much to drink. So I went home and I got into bed. About 10 o'clock, I hear a noise. It's a car, so I go outside to see who it is. <clears throat> Some kind of car, you know, one of those vans. Two fellers inside. I go up to them and... Damn, but they don't fall over dead. Scariest thing you ever saw. But it's funny. What's funny? That was the only other car to come through all night. Normally, there's lots of cars. There was another car? Yep. Willis. <laughs> Highway Patrol. He came through about 15, 30 seconds before it all started. Jackson sighed and let his head fall back against the pillow. Now, he said, if you don't mind, I'm going to get me some sleep. I'm all talked out. The room was huge, the size of a football field. It was furnished sparsely, just a few tables scattered about. Inside the room, voices echoed as the technicians called to each other, positioning the pieces of wreckage. One of the biophysicists came up to Manchek holding a clear plastic bag. He waved the contents under Manchek's nose. Just got it back from the lab, he said. What is it? Manchek asked. A depolymerized polymer, the biochemist said, smacking his lips with satisfaction. Just back from the lab. What kind of polymer? A polymer was a repeating molecule, built up from thousands of the same units like a stack of dominoes. Most plastics, nylon, rayon, plant cellulose, and even glycogen in the human body were polymers. A polymer of the plastic used on the air hose Keep of the right, Phantom Jet. And the face mask right. to the pilot. We thought as much. Manchik frowned. He looked slowly at the crumbly exit black right. powder in the bag. Plastic? Yes, the biochemist said. A polymer. Depolymerized. It was broken down. Now that's no vibration effect. It's a biochemical effect, purely organic. Slowly, Manchik began to understand. You mean something tore the plastic apart? Yes, you could say that, the biochemist replied. It's a simplification, of course, but... What tore it apart? The biochemist shrugged. Chemical reaction of some sort. Acid could do it, or intense heat, or... Or? A microorganism, I suppose. If one existed that could eat plastic. <laughs> if you know what I mean. I think, Manchek said, that I know what you mean. After his conversation with Peter Jackson, Hall went to see Burton in the autopsy room. I keep wondering, Hall said, about the insanity. Talking with Jackson reminded me of it. A large number of people in the town went insane or at least became bizarre and suicidal during the evening. 
Now, many of those people were old. Burton frowned. So? Old people, all said, are like Jackson. They have lots wrong with them. Their bodies are breaking down in a variety of ways. The lungs are bad, the hearts are bad, the livers are shot, the vessels are sclerotic. And this alters the disease process? Perhaps, Hall said. I just keep wondering. And there's something else, Hall said. Jackson recalls hearing one victim say, just before he died, Oh God, my head. Burton stared away into space. You're thinking of Emery. Hall nodded. It makes sense, he said, at least to check. If the Andromeda strain produced hemorrhage inside the brain for any reason, then it might produce rapid, unusual mental aberrations. But we already know that the organism acts by clotting. Yes, Hall said, in most people, not all. Burton remembered the rats he had anticoagulated, the ones who had died anyway, but he had no autopsies. My God, he said. He drew out one of the rats from cold storage and cut it open. It bled. Quickly, he incised the head, exposing the brain. There he found a large hemorrhage over the gray surface of the brain. You've got it, Paul said. If the animal is normal, it dies from coagulation beginning at the lungs. But if coagulation is prevented, then the organism erodes through the vessels of the brain and hemorrhage occurs. And insanity, Hall said. Yes, Burton was now very excited. And coagulation could be prevented by any blood disorder. Or too little vitamin K, malabsorption syndrome, poor liver function, impaired protein synthesis, and any of a dozen things. All more likely to be found in an old person, Hall said. Sir Winston Churchill once said that true genius resides in the capacity for evaluation of uncertain, hazardous, and conflicting information. Yet it is a peculiarity of the wildfire team that despite the individual brilliance of team members, the group grossly misjudged their information at several points. The team had a blind spot, which Stone later expressed this way. We were problem-oriented. Everything we did, we thought and directed toward finding a solution, a cure to Andromeda. And of course, we were fixed on the events that had occurred at Piedmont. Well, he felt that if we didn't find a solution, no solution would be forthcoming, and the whole world would ultimately wind up like Piedmont. We we're very slow to think otherwise. Their error began to take on major proportions with the cultures. Stone and Levitt had taken thousands of cultures from the original capsule. These had been incubated in a wide variety of atmospheric, temperature, and pressure conditions. The results of this could only be analyzed by computer. When Stone and Levitt went to examine the results, they found several striking trends. Their first conclusion was that growth media did not matter at all. The organism grew equally well on sugar, blood, chocolate, plain agar, or sheer glass. However, the gases in which the plates were incubated were crucial, as was the light. Ultraviolet light stimulated growth under all circumstances. Total darkness and to a lesser extent infrared light inhibited growth. Oxygen inhibited growth in all circumstances, but carbon dioxide stimulated growth. Nitrogen had no effect. Thus, best growth was achieved in 100% carbon dioxide lighted by ultraviolet radiation. Poorest growth occurred in pure oxygen incubated in total darkness. What do you make of it, Stone said? It looks like a pure conversion system, Levitt said. I wonder, Stone said. He punched through the coordinates of a closed growth system. Closed growth systems studied bacterial metabolism by measuring intake of gases and nutrients in output of waste products. They were completely sealed and self-contained. A plant in such a system, for example, would consume carbon dioxide and give off water and oxygen. But when they looked at the Andromeda strain, they found something remarkable. The organism had no excretions. If incubated with a carbon dioxide in ultraviolet light, it grew steadily until all carbon dioxide had been consumed. Then growth stopped. There was no excretion of any kind of gas or waste product at all. No waste. Clearly efficient, Keep said. left. You would expect that, Levitt said. This was an organism highly suited to its environment. 
It consumed everything, wasted nothing. It was perfect for the barren existence of space. Stone thought about this for a moment, and then it hit him. It hit Levitt at the same time. Good Christ. Levitt was already reaching for the phone. Get Robertson, he said. Get him immediately. The screen came to life. They saw Robertson, looking tired, smoking a cigarette. Jeremy, you gotta give me time. I haven't been able to get through to... Listen, Stone said. I want you to make sure Directive 712 is not carried out. It is imperative. No atomic device must be detonated around the organisms. That's the last thing in the world, literally, that we want to do. He explained briefly what they had found. Robertson whistled. We just provide a fantastically rich growth medium. That's right, Stone said. If you had an organism that was capable of directly converting energy to matter, and if you provided it with a huge, rich source of energy, like an atomic blast... Robertson was scratching his head. I got some more data on the Phantom Crash. It was over the area west of Piedmont at 23,000 feet. The post team has found evidence of the disintegration the pilot spoke of, but the material that was destroyed was a, was a plastic of some kind. It was depolymerized. What does the post team make of that, Stone said. They don't know what the hell to make of it, Robertson admitted. And there's something else. They found a few pieces of bone that have been identified as human, a bit of humerus and tibia, notable because they are clean, almost polished. Flesh burned away, Stone asked. It doesn't look that way. Stone frowned at Levitt. What does it look like? It looks like clean, polished bone. They say it's weird as hell. And there's something else. We checked into the National Guard around Piedmont the one twelfth station in a hundred-mile radius, and it turns out they've been running patrols into the area for a distance of fifty miles. They've had as many as one hundred men west of Piedmont. No deaths. Stone said, I think we better check our cultured organisms for biologic potency. Run some of them against a rat? Levitt asked. Stone nodded. Make sure it's still virulent, still the same. As they were about to start, the level five Drive monitor safe. clicked on and said, Dr. Levitt. Levitt answered. Keep on left. On the computer screen was a pleasant young man in a white lab coat. Yes. Dr. Levitt, we have gotten our electroencephalograms back from the computer center. Yours were read as grade four, atypical, probably benign, but we'd like to run another set. I'm rather busy now, Levitt said. Stone broke in, talking directly to the technician. Dr. Levitt will get a repeat EEG when he has the chance. Very good, sir, the technician said. When the screen was blank, Stone said, there are times when this damn routine gets on everybody's nerves. X-ray crystallography analysis showed that the Andromeda organism was not composed of component parts, as a normal cell was composed of nucleus, mitochondria, and ribosomes. Andromeda had no subunits, no smaller particles. Instead, a single substance seemed to form the walls and interior. This substance produced a characteristic precession photograph or scatter pattern of X-rays. Looking at the results, Stone said, a series of six-sided rings. And nothing else, Levitt said. How the hell does it operate? The two men were at a loss to explain how simple an organism would utilize energy for growth. A rather common ring structure, Levitt said. A phenolic group, nothing more. It should be reasonably inert. Yet it can convert energy to matter, Stone said. Levitt scratched his head. He thought back to the city analogy. The molecule was simple in its building blocks. It possessed no remarkable powers, taking Keep a single left. unit. Yet collectively, it had great powers. Perhaps there is a critical level, a structural complexity that makes possible what is not possible in a similar but simple structure. Stone and Levitt puzzled over the problem for several minutes until they came to the Fourier electron density scans. Here the probability of finding electrons was mapped for the structure on a chart that resembled a topological map. They noticed something odd. The Keep structure left. was present but the Fourier mapping was inconstant. It almost looks, Stone said, as if part of the structure is switched off in some way. It's not uniform at all, Levitt said. 
Tired, Paul rubbed his eyes and sipped the coffee. He was alone in the cafeteria, which was silent except for the muted ticking of the teleprinter in the corner. After a time, he got up and went over to the teleprinter, examining the rolls of paper that had come from it. Most of the information was meaningless to him. But then he saw one item that interested him. An Arizona Highway Patrolman, Martin Willis, had shot and killed five people in a diner before killing himself. According to one waitress who had survived the incident, Willis took out a revolver and shot the customers, moving methodically from one to the next, shooting each in the forehead. Then, he allegedly turned to the waitress, a Miss Sally Conover, and smiling said, I love you, Shirley Temple, placed the barrel in his mouth and fired the last bullet. Paul remembered that Officer Willis had gone through Piedmont earlier in the morning, just a few minutes before the disease broke out. He immediately called the Arizona Highway Patrol and spoke to the medical examiner, a Dr. Smithson. Did Willis have an ulcer, Hall asked. Ulcer? No, he never had an ulcer that I know of. Did he have any medical problem? Diabetes, Smithson said. Diabetes? Yeah, and he was pretty casual about it. We had diagnosed him five, six years ago at the age of 30. Had a pretty severe case. We put him on insulin 50 units a day, but he was casual, like I said. Showed up in the hospital once or twice in a coma because he wouldn't take his insulin. Said he hated the needles. We almost put him off the force because we were afraid to let him drive a car. Thought he'd go into acidosis at the wheel and conk out. After he hung up the phone, Paul sat back in his chair and thought about what he had learned. He was excited and felt on the verge of an important discovery. Three people, a diabetic in acidosis from failure to take insulin, an old man who drank sterno and took aspirin, also in acidosis. Keep right. A young infant. And then exit right. One had survived for hours. The other two had survived longer, apparently permanently. Exit right. One had right. gone mad. The other two had not. Somehow, they were all interrelated in a very simple way. Acidosis. Rapid breathing. Carbon dioxide content. Oxygen saturation. Dizziness. Fatigue. Somehow they were all logically coordinated, and they held the key to beating Andromeda. At that moment, the emergency bell sounded, ringing in a high-pitched, urgent way as the bright yellow light began to flash. He jumped up and left the room. In the corridor, he saw the flashing sign that indicated the source of the trouble, autopsy. As he Go ran down the corridor, on. a quiet, soothing voice on the loudspeaker said, Seal has been broken in autopsy. Seal has been broken in autopsy. This is an emergency. A lab technician came out of the lab and saw him. What is it? Burton, I think. Infection spread. Levitt came out of the morphology right. room and joined them. Suddenly, Levitt stopped. He stood, riveted to the ground, and stared straight forward at the flashing sign and the light above it blinking on and off. Paul stopped and went back. Peter, come on, we need your... He said nothing more. A small dribble of spittle was coming from the corner of Levitt's mouth. Paul quickly stepped behind him. With frightening speed, Levitt's knees gave way and he collapsed to the floor. He lay on his back and his whole body began to vibrate. His head hammered against the floor. Paul slipped his foot beneath the back of Levitt's head and let him bang against his toes. He may go into status, Hall said to the technician. Go to the pharmacy, get me 100 milligrams of phenobarb, now in a syringe. As soon as he injected the barbiturate, he told the technician, I think he'll be all right, don't try to move him. And Hall ran down to the autopsy lab. For several seconds, he tried to open the door to the lab, and then he realized it had been sealed off. The lab was contaminated. He went on to main control and found Stone looking at Burton through the closed circuit TV monitors. Burton was breathing in rapid, shallow gasps, and he could not speak. He looked exactly like what he was, a man waiting for death to strike him. Stone was trying to reassure him. Just take it easy. Take it easy. Stone turned to Hall. You took your time getting here. Where's Levitt? Your lights flash at three per second, and he had a seizure. What? Stone asked. Petite mall. It went on to a grand mall attack, tonic-clonic seizure, urinary incontinence, the whole bit. I got him onto phenobarb and came as soon as I could. Levitt has epilepsy? That's right. Recomputing. You must not have Never known, mind. Stone said. I'll find you a must new not have realized. route. 
And then Stone remembered the request for a repeat electroencephalogram. Keep right. Ah, Hall said he knew all right. He was avoiding flashing lights which will bring on an attack. I'm sure he knew. We've got pure oxygen running into Burton, Stone said. That should help him until we know something more. Stone flicked off the microphone button connecting voice transmission to Burton. Actually, it will take several minutes to hook in, but I've told them we've already started. He's sealed off in there, so the infection has stopped at that point. The rest of the base is okay, at least. How did it happen, the hall asked. The contamination. Seal must have broken, Stone said. So many seals, so much rubber, of such and such a thickness, they'd all break given time. Burton happened to be there when one went. Hall didn't see it so simply. He looked in at Burton, who was breathing rapidly, his chest heaving in terror. Hall said, how long has it been? Four minutes. Burton's still alive, Hall said. Yes, thank God. And then Stone frowned. He realized the point. Why, Hall said, is he still alive? The oxygen? You said yourself the oxygen isn't running yet. What's protecting Burton? Burton interrupted them before Stone had a chance to answer. Stone did his best to calm him, then turned off the microphone again and said to Hall, we know that the oxygen inhibits growth of the Andromeda strain. That will be good for Burton. It will be good for him, make him a little giddy, a little relaxed, and slow his breathing down. Poor fellow is scared to death. Somehow Stone's phrase stuck in Hall's mind. Scared to death. He thought about it, and then began to see that Stone had hit upon something important. The phrase was a clue. It was the answer. Hall walked back to his lab and stared through the glass at the old man and the infant. He looked at the two of them and tried to think, but his brain was running in frantic circles. A cop who didn't take his insulin and had a habit of going into ketoacidosis. An old man who drank sterno, which gave him methanolism and acidosis. A baby who did what? What gave him acidosis? Hall shook his head. Always he came back to the baby, who was normal, not acidotic. Take it from the beginning, he told himself. Be logical. If a person has metabolic acidosis, any kind of acidosis, what does he do? He has too much acid in his body. He can die from too much acid, just as if he had injected hydrochloric acid into his veins. Too much acid meant death. But the body could compensate by breathing rapidly. Because in that manner, the lungs blew off carbon dioxide and the body's supply of carbonic acid, which was what carbon dioxide formed in the blood, decreased. A way to get rid of acid, rapid breathing. And Andromeda? What happened to the organism when you were acidotic and breathing fast? Perhaps fast breathing kept the organism from getting into your lungs long enough to penetrate to blood vessels. Maybe that was the answer. Again, he shook his head. Because a person with acidosis like Willis or Jackson was one thing. But what about the baby? The baby was normal. If it breathed rapidly, it would become alkalotic, basic, too little acid, not acidotic. The baby would go to the opposite extreme. He thought of the baby, its face turning purple, the little eyes wrinkling, the mouth toothless and smooth-gummed, shrieking, scared to death. And then the birds with the fast metabolic rate, the fast heart rates, the fast breathing rates. The birds who did everything fast, they too survived. Breathing fast, was it as simple as that? He punched keys at his computer. At last the program was set. On the display screen he saw what he wanted. Growth of Andromeda as a function of pH, of acidity, alkalinity. The results were quite clear. The Andromeda strain grew within a narrow range. If the medium for growth was too acid, the organism would not multiply. If it was too basic, it would not multiply. Only within the range of pH 7.39 to 7.43 would it grow well. He stared at the graph for a moment, then ran for the door. On his way out, he grinned at his assistant and said, It's all over. Our troubles are finished. He could not have been more wrong. The oxygen's going in, Stone said. Stop it, Hall said. What? Stop it now. Put him on room air. Hall was looking at Burton. 
On the screen, it was clear that the oxygen was beginning to affect him. He was no longer breathing so rapidly. His chest moved slowly. Paul picked up the microphone. Burton, he said. This is Hall. Keep right. I've got the answer. Exit We're switching right. back to air. Now start breathing as fast as you can. Stone suddenly understood. Exit the child, right. he said. It screamed. Yes. And the old fellow with the aspirin hyperventilated. Yes, and drank Sterno besides. And both of them shot their acid-based barrels to hell, right. Stone said. Yes, Hall said. My trouble was I was hung up on the acidosis. I didn't understand how the baby could become acidotic. The answer, of course, was that it didn't. It became basic, too little acid. But that was all right. You could go either way, too much acid or too little, as long as you got out of the growth range of Andromeda. Listen, Stone said, we can't keep Burton that way forever. Sooner or later... Yes, Paul said. We'll alkalinize his blood. Burton, look around the lab. Do you see anything we could use to raise your blood pH? Burton looked. No, not really. Bicarbonate of soda, ascorbic acid, vinegar, anything? Burton searched frantically among the bottles and reagents on the lab shelf and finally shook his head. The nothing here that will work. Paul looked around the lab from his vantage point, and it was while doing this that he noticed the rat, a black Norway sitting calmly in its cage in a corner of the room watching Burton. He stopped. The rat. It was breathing slowly and easily. Stone saw the rat and said, What the hell? And then as they watched, the lights began to flash again. Go straight on. And the computer console blinked on. Early degenerative change in gasket. V-1126886. Christ, someone said. Where does the gasket lead? It's one of the core gaskets. It connects all the labs. They looked at the screen in astonishment. Something is wrong, Stone said. Very wrong. In rapid succession, the computer flashed the number of nine more gaskets that were breaking down. I don't understand, Stone said. And then Hall said, The child, of course. Child? And that damned airplane, it all fits. What are you talking about, Stone said. The child was normal, Hall said. It could cry and disrupt its acid-base balance. Well and good. That would prevent the Andromeda strain from getting into its bloodstream and multiplying and killing it. Yes, yes, Stone said. You've told me all that. But what happens when the child stops crying? Stone stared at him. He said nothing. I mean, Hall said, that sooner or later that kid had to stop crying. It couldn't cry forever. Sooner or later it would stop and its acid-base balance would return to normal. Then it would be vulnerable to Andromeda. True, Stone said. But it didn't die. Perhaps some rapid form of immunity? No, Hall said. Impossible. There are only two explanations. When the child stopped crying, either the organism was no longer there, had been blown away, cleared from the air, or else the organism... Right. Changed, Stone said. Mutated. Yes. Mutated to a non-infection form. And perhaps it is still mutating. Now it's no longer directly harmful to man, but it eats rubber gaskets. The airplane, Stone said. Hall nodded. National Guardsmen could be on the ground and not be harmed. But the pilot had his aircraft destroyed because the plastic was dissolved before his eyes. So Burton is now exposed to a harmless organism. That's why the rat is alive, Stone said. That's why Burton is alive, Hall said. The rapid breathing isn't necessary. He's only alive because Andromeda changed. It may change again, Stone said. And if most mutations occur at times of multiplication, when the organism is growing most rapidly, the sirens went off and the computer flashed a message in red. Gasket integrity zero. Level five contaminated and sealed. Stone turned to Hall. Quick, he said, get out of here. There's no substation in this lab. You have to go to the next sector. For a moment, Hall didn't understand. He continued to sit in his seat. And then when the realization hit him, he scrambled for the door and hurried outside to the corridor. As he did so, he heard a hissing sound and a thump as a massive steel plate slid out from a wall and closed off the corridor. Stone saw it and swore. That does it, he said. We're trapped here. If the bomb goes off, it'll spread the organism all over the surface. There will be a thousand mutations, each killing in a different way. We'll never be rid of it. Over the loudspeaker, a flat, mechanical voice was saying, The level is closed. The level is closed. 
This is an emergency. The level is closed. There was a moment of silence, and then a scratching sound, as a new Keep recording left, came on. And then and Miss Gladys left. Stevens of Omaha, Nebraska said quietly, There are now three minutes to atomic self-destruct. Turn left. Automatic, Stone said quietly. The system cuts in when the level is contaminated. We can't let it happen. Hall was holding the key in his hand. There's no way to get to a substation? Not on this level. Go straight Each on. Each sector is sealed from every other. But there are substations right. on the other levels. Yes. How do I get up? You can't. All the conventional routes are sealed. What about the central core? The central core communicated with all levels. Stone shrugged. <sighs> the safeguards. Paul remembered talking to Burton earlier about the central core safeguards. In theory, once inside the central core, you could go straight to the top. But in practice, there were ligamine sensors located around the core to prevent this. Originally intended to prevent escape of lab animals that might break free into the core, the sensors released ligamine, a curare derivative that was water-soluble in the form of a gas. There were also automatic guns that fired ligamine darts. The mechanical voice said, There are now two minutes, 45 seconds to self-destruct. Paul was already moving into the lab and staring through the glass into the inner work area. Beyond that was the central core. What are my chances, Hall said. They don't exist, Stone answered. Hall bent over and crawled through a tunnel into a plastic suit. He waited until it had sealed behind him, and then he picked up a knife and cut away at the tunnel like a tail. He breathed in the air of the lab, which was cool and fresh, and laced with Andromeda organisms. Nothing happened. Back in the lab, Stone watched him through the glass. Paul saw his lips move, but heard nothing. Then a moment later, the speakers cut in, and he heard Stone say, There's only one chance. The doses are low. Go They're calculated on. for a 10-kilogram animal, like a large monkey, and you weigh 70 kilograms or so. You can stand a fairly heavy dose before... Before I stop breathing, Hall said. The victims of curare suffocate to death. Their chest muscles and diaphragms paralyzed. Hall was certain it was an unpleasant way to die. Wish me luck, he said. There are now two minutes, thirty seconds to self-destruct, Gladys Stevens said. Hall slammed the gasket with his fist and it crumbled in a dusty cloud. He moved out into the central core. It was silent. He was away from the sirens and flashing lights of the level, and into a cold, metallic, echoing space. The central core was perhaps thirty feet wide, painted a utilitarian gray, the core itself, a cylindrical shaft of cables and machinery, lay before him. On the wall, he could see the rungs Keep of a left, ladder leading up to level turn four. Left. I have you on the TV monitor, Stone's voice said. Start up the ladder, the gas will begin any moment. A new recorded voice broke turn in. Left. The central core has been contaminated. Authorized maintenance personnel are advised to clear the area immediately. Go, Stone said. Hall climbed. As he went up the circular wall, he looked back and saw pale clouds of white smoke blanketing the floor. That's the gas, Stone said. Keep going. Paul climbed quickly, hand over hand, moving turn up the left. rungs. He was breathing hard, partly from the exertion, partly from emotion. The sensors have you, Stone said. Stone was sitting in the level five laboratory watching on the consoles as the computer electric eyes picked up Paul and outlined his body moving up the wall. To Stone, he seemed painfully vulnerable. Stone glanced over at a third screen, which showed the ligamine ejectors pivoting on their wall brackets, the slim barrels coming around to take aim. Go! On the screen, Hall's body was outlined in red on a vivid green background. As Stone watched, a crosshair was superimposed over the body, centering on the neck. The computer was programmed to choose a region of high blood flow. For most animals, the neck was better than the back. Hall, climbing up the core wall, was aware only of the distance and his fatigue. He felt strangely and totally exhausted, as if he had been climbing for hours. Then he realized that the gas was beginning to affect him. The sensors have picked you up, Stone said, but you have only ten more yards. Hall glanced back and saw one of the sensor units. It was aimed directly at him. As he watched, it fired a small puff of bluish smoke spurting from the barrel. There was a whistling sound, and then something struck the wall next to him and fell to the ground. 
Missed that time. Keep going. Another dart slammed into the wall near his neck. He tried to hurry, tried to move faster. Above, he could see the door with the plain white markings, level four. Stone was right, less than ten yards to go. A third dart, and then a fourth. The voice said, There are now two minutes to self-destruct. Paul continued to climb. He felt sluggish, like a 400-pound man, but he continued to climb. He reached the next door just as a dart slammed into the wall near his cheekbone. The door had a seal and handle. He tugged at the handle while still another dart struck the wall. That's it. That's it. You're going to make it, Stone said. There are now 90 seconds to self-destruct, the voice said. The handle spun. With a hiss of air, the door came open. He moved into an inner chamber just as a Go dart struck on. his leg with a brief searing wave of heat. And suddenly, instantly, he was a thousand pounds heavier. He moved in slow motion as he reached for the door and pulled it shut behind him. You're an airlock, Stone said. Turn the next door handle. Paul moved toward the inner door. It was several miles away, an infinite trip, a distance beyond hope. His feet were encased in lead, his legs were granite. He felt sleepy and achingly tired as he took one step, and then another, and another. There are now sixty seconds to self-destruct. Time was passing swiftly. He could not understand it, as if in a dream. He turned the handle. Fight the drug, you can do it, Stone said. What happened next was difficult to recall. He saw the handle turn and the door open. He was dimly aware of a woman, a technician, standing in the hallway as he staggered through. She watched him with frightened eyes as he took a single clumsy step forward. Help me, he said. She hesitated. Her eyes got wider and then she ran down the corridor away from him. He watched her stupidly and fell to the ground. Forty-five seconds to self-destruct, the voice said, and then he was angry because the voice was female and seductive and recorded, because someone had planned it this way, had written out a series of inexorable statements, like a script, which was now being followed by the computers, together with all the polished, perfect machinery of the laboratory. It was as if this was his fate planned from the beginning, and he was angry. Later, Hall could not remember how he managed to crawl the final distance nor could he remember how he was able to get to his knees and reach up with the key. He did remember twisting it in the lock and watching as the green light came Keep on again. Right. Self-destruct has been cancelled, the voice announced, as if it were quite normal. Hall slid to the floor, heavy, exhausted, and watched as blackness closed in around him. Keep right, and then turn right. A voice from far away said, He's fighting it. Is he? Turn yes. right. Look. And then a moment later, Hall coughed as something was pulled from his throat and he coughed again, gasped for air, and opened his eyes. He looked around the room. He was in the infirmary on level four. On the far wall was a television monitor which showed Stone's face. Hello, Hall said. Stone grinned. Congratulations. Go straight on. I take it the bomb didn't. The bomb didn't, Stone said. Oh, that's good, Hall said and closed his eyes. He slept for more than an hour, and when he awoke, the television screen was blank. A nurse told him that Dr. Stone was talking to Vandenberg. What's happening, Hall asked. According to predictions, the organism is over Los Angeles now. And, Keep right, Hall asked, and then the nurse turn shrugged. Right. Nothing. It seems to have no effect at all. Turn right. None whatsoever, Stone said much later. It has apparently mutated to a benign form. We're still waiting for a bizarre report of death or disease, but it's been six hours now, and it gets less likely with every minute. We suspect that ultimately, it will migrate back out of the atmosphere since there's too much oxygen down here. But of course, if the bomb had gone off in wildfire... How much time was left, Hall said. When you turn the key, about 34 seconds. Plenty of time, Hall smiled. Hardly even exciting. Perhaps from where you were, Stone said. But down on level five, it was very exciting indeed. I neglected to tell you that in order to improve the subterranean detonation characteristics of the atomic device, all air is evacuated from level five, beginning 30 seconds before explosion. Uh-huh, Paul said. But things are under control, Stone said. 
We have the organism and can continue to study it. We've already begun to characterize a variety of mutant forms. It's a rather astonishing organism in its versatility. He smiled. I think we can be fairly confident that the organism will move into the upper atmosphere without causing further difficulty on the surface, so there's no problem there. And as for us down here, we understand what's happening now in terms of the mutations. That's the important thing, that we understand. Understand, Paul repeated. Yes, Keep Starzer. right, and then turn right. We have right. to understand. Turn right. We hope Keep you have left, enjoyed this production of turn left. The Andromeda Strain by Michael Crichton, read turn by Chris left. North, produced by John Wager, abridgment by Treby Johnson, text copyright 1969 by Centesis Corporation, Go production copyright on. 1993 Random House Inc., all rights reserved. trouble with it is trying to decide what to call these words, man, or trying to decide what to call this whole thing. You know, what are these words that I'm talking about? They're just words that we've decided, sort of decided, not to use all the time. That's about the only thing you can really say about them for sure, that they're just some words, not many either, just a few, that we've decided, well, we won't use them all the time. Sometimes, well, hell yeah. Sometimes it's okay, but not all the time. That's, and they're the only words that seem to have that restriction. I mean, there are a lot of words you can say whenever you want, you know. Pneumonia! Nobody gives you a lot of... All right, you can't yell it in the hospital a great deal, but what the hell? There are words that you can say, no problem. Topography! No one has ever gone to jail for screaming topography. But there are some words that you can go to jail for. There are some words that we just have decided we will not say all the time. Sometimes, okay, if you're running through the jungle chasing somebody that we're at war with, you can holler them. If you're shooting a criminal, it's okay, it's the all-American thing. Dirty fucking crook. <laughs> but if you're with the bishop's wife at lunch, it's better not to ask for the goddamn lettuce. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like we've decided there'd be some words we won't say all the time. And I was just trying to find out which words they were. For sure, all of them. I wanted a list. Because nobody gives you a list. That's the problem. They don't give you a list. Wouldn't you think it'd be normal if they didn't want you to say something to tell you what it is? Nobody even tells you when you're a kid what the words are that you're supposed to avoid. You have to say them to find out which ones they are. <laughs> Shit! <laughs> ah! Oh, fuck! <laughs> ah! That's two. <laughs> oh, ma, that's enough trial and error, huh? Please, Ma, give me a list, huh? <laughs> All right, you're six years old now, and here's the list of words your dad and I don't ever want to hear you say. Oh, hey, thanks, Ma. Boy, that's going to save me an ass kicking or two. <laughs> ah! oh. Yeah, you never know what's going to be on the list. Because it's always somebody else's list. You didn't make that up. Somebody told you that shit. They told you, better, better not say that. So you gotta, and you don't know what's gonna be on their list. God, people's lists even change from day to day. Some people on Friday night got a list, you know, not about two or three words. Sunday morning, goddamn, they made 27 words. On These are the same people two days later. Different list. So you gotta kinda watch out what you're gonna believe from them. The trouble is, I was trying to find out what these words might be. And I wanted to know the ones that you could never say on television. I mean the filthy words that are always filthy. There are a lot of these little two-way, double entendre words that have two meanings, words that are okay part of the time. I call them like part-time filth. Some of these words, they're only 50% dirty. 
You have words like ass. Ass is hardly even a dirty word anymore, but it has a few meanings that you can't say on television. That's what I was talking about. What can you say on television? That's another one of those places where we can't use these words all the time. But some of them are all right some of the time. Ass is all right on television. You can say on television things like, well, you've made a perfect ass of yourself tonight. But you can't say, hey, let's go get some ass. <laughs> Bitch. Bitch is another word like that. Same kind of word. It's the only dirty part of the time. Depends on what you mean by bitch. You might be the lady from the San Diego Zoo visiting one of the Tonight Shows, and you might just have a bunch of little canines with you there. One of them is a female, and you say, there's the bitch, Johnny, and it's okay, fine. Just don't refer to the singer the same way. That's <laughs> Is that bitch going to do another number? Yes. <laughs> Animals are fine on those two-way words, and that's it. That's what I was trying to find. The words that were always dirty, not just part of the time but completely filth. Well, in, in looking for these words, I kept finding new categories. We have so many ways of describing these dirty words. It's, well, we have more ways to describe dirty words than we actually have dirty words. That seems a little strange to me. It seems to indicate that somebody was awfully interested in these words. <laughs> they kept referring to them. They called them bad words, dirty. Filthy, foul, vile, vulgar, coarse, in poor taste, unseemly, street talk, gutter talk, locker room language, <laughs> barracks talk, body, naughty, saucy, raunchy, rude, crude, lewd, lascivious, indecent, profane, obscene, blue, off color, <laughs> risque, suggestive. Cursing, cussing, swearing, and all I could think of was shit, piss, fuck, cunt, cock, suck a motherfucker, and tits. <laughs> That's all I knew. <laughs> shit, piss, fuck, cunt, cock, suck a motherfucker, and tits. That was my original list. I knew it wasn't complete, but it was a starter set, you know? <laughs> shit, piss, fuck, yes, WBAI is the one who played them. Shit, piss, fuck, cunt, cock, suck a motherfucker, and tits. Now, that was the original list. We've added a few words since then. We've added fart, turd, and twat. <laughs> and I know there are some other words that many of you are wondering about, why they haven't been considered, why they haven't shown up on the list thus far. We're looking at them all very closely. Some of your favorites might make the list this year. <laughs> Asshole, ball bag, hard on, piss hard, blue balls, taint, nookie, snatch, box, Pussy, pecker, peckerhead, pecker tracks, jism, joint, doniker, dork, poontang. <laughs> cornhole, and dingleberry. <laughs> dingleberry, a very popular word. And to my way of thinking, dingleberry, a rather innocent sounding word. Dingleberry sounds Christmassy to me, you know. <laughs> Let's put one on the tree, Dad. <laughs> I would have been out here a little bit sooner, but they gave me uh, the wrong dressing room and I couldn't find any place to put my stuff. And I don't know how you are, but I need a place to put my stuff. So that's what I've been doing back there, just trying to find a place for my stuff. You know how important that is. That's the whole, that's the whole meaning of life, isn't it? Trying to find a place for your stuff. That's all your house is. Your house is just a place for your stuff. If you didn't have so much goddamn stuff, you wouldn't need a house. You could just walk around all the time. That's all your house is, it's a pile of stuff with a cover on it. You see that when you take off in an airplane and you look down and you see everybody's got a little pile of stuff. Everybody's got their own pile of stuff. And when you leave your stuff, you gotta lock it up. Wouldn't want somebody to come by and take some of your stuff. They always take the good stuff. They don't bother with that crap you're saving. Ain't nobody interested in your fourth grade arithmetic papers. They're looking for the good stuff. That's all your house is. It's a place to keep your stuff while you go out and get more stuff. <laughs> now, sometimes, sometimes you've got to move. You've got to get a bigger house. Why? Too much stuff. You've got to move all your stuff. And maybe put some of your stuff in storage. Now imagine that. There's a whole industry based on keeping an eye on your stuff. 
Enough about your stuff. Let's talk about other people's stuff. Did you ever notice when you go to somebody else's house, you never quite feel 100% at home? You know why? No room for your stuff. Somebody else's stuff is all over the place. And what awful stuff it is. Where did they get this stuff? And if you have to stay overnight at someone's house, you know, unexpectedly, and they give you a little room to sleep in that they don't use that often. Keep Someone up. died in it 11 years ago. <laughs> and they haven't moved any of his stuff. <laughs> or wherever they give you to sleep, usually right near the bed, there's a dresser, and there's never any room on the dresser for your stuff. Someone else's shit is on the dresser. <laughs> have you noticed that their stuff is shit, and your shit is stuff? <laughs> Now, now, sometimes you go on vacation, you got to bring some of your stuff with you. You can't bring all your stuff. Just the stuff you really like. The stuff that fits you well that month. Let's say you're going to go to Honolulu. You're going to go all the way to Honolulu. You got to take two big bags of stuff. Plus your carry-on stuff, plus the stuff in your pockets. You get all the way to Honolulu and you get in your hotel room and you start to put away your stuff. That's the first thing you do in a hotel room is put away your stuff. I'll put some stuff in here, put some stuff down there. Here's another place for stuff here. I'll put some stuff over there. You put your stuff over there. I'm putting my stuff over here. Here's another place for stuff. Hey, we got more places than we've got stuff. We're going to have to buy more stuff. Yeah. And you put all your stuff away and you know that you're thousands of miles from home and you don't quite feel at ease, but you know that you must be okay because you do have some of your stuff with you. And you relax in Honolulu on that basis. That's when your friend from Maui calls and says, Hey, why don't you come over to Maui for the weekend? Spend a couple of nights over here. Oh, shit, no. Now what stuff do you bring? Right, you've got to bring an even smaller version of your stuff. Just enough stuff for a weekend on Maui. And you get over, and you're really spread out now. You've got shit all over the world. You've got stuff at home, stuff in storage, stuff in Honolulu, stuff in Maui, stuff in your pockets. Supply lines are getting longer and harder to maintain. But you get over to your friend's house in Maui and they give you a little place to sleep and there's a little window ledge or some kind of a small shelf and there's not much room on it, but it's okay because you don't have much stuff now. And you put what stuff you do have up there, you put your imported French toenail clippers, your odor readers with the 45-day guarantee, your cinnamon-flavored dental floss, and your Afrin 12-hour decongestant nasal spray. And even though you're a long way from home, you know that you must be okay because you do have your Afrin 12-hour decongestant nasal spray. And you relax in Maui on that basis. That's when your friend says, Hey, I think tonight we'll go over the other side of the island and stay at my friend's house overnight. Oh, shit, no! No! What do you bring? Now you just bring the things you know you're gonna need. Money, keys, comb, wallet, lighter, hanky pen, cigarettes, contraceptives, Vaseline, whips, chains, whistles, dildos, and a book. Here's some just plain old words that are sort of fun to uh, think of or look at more closely than usual. Things like hot water heater. Have you ever have you thought of hot water heaters? Pardon me? I said I'd like to buy a hot water heater. What the hell for? <laughs> Hot water doesn't need to be heated. <laughs> you must want a cold water heater. <laughs> How about a hot water cooler? <laughs> yeah, some words are fun. Words like f flammable. Flammable? Inflammable and non inflammable. <laughs> Why are there three? <laughs> Does it seem to you as though two words ought to be able to handle that idea? <laughs> I mean, either the thing flams or it doesn't flam. 
Now, flammable, flammable, that's the one that's on the side of the truck. Flammable. As if you're going to get out of your car at 60 miles an hour and smoke on his truck, huh? <laughs> Flammable. I found out the reason it says that on the truck is so that just in case you should be spinning out of control at 70 or 80, heading for the truck, you'll know what it was that happened, you know? <laughs> like to talk a little bit about baseball and football. <laughs> Starting with baseball. Baseball is different from any other sport in a lot of different little ways. For instance, in most sports, you score points or you score goals. In baseball, you score runs. In most sports, the ball or the object is put in play by the offensive team. In baseball, the defense puts the ball in play, and only the defensive team is allowed to touch the ball. In fact, in baseball, if an offensive player touches the ball intentionally, he's out. Also, most sports, the team is run by a coach. In baseball, the team is run by a manager. And only in baseball does the manager or the coach have to wear the same uniform the players do. Can you picture Bill Parcells in his New York Giants uniform? Now, baseball and football are different from one another in other kind of interesting ways, I think. First of all, um, baseball is a 19th century pastoral game. Football is a 20th century technological struggle. <laughs> baseball is played on a diamond in a park, the baseball park. Football is played on a gridiron in a stadium sometimes called Soldier Field or War Memorial Stadium. <laughs> Baseball begins in the spring, the season of new life. Football begins in the fall when everything is dying. <laughs> in football, you wear a helmet. In baseball, you wear a cap. Football is concerned with downs. What down is it? Baseball is concerned with ups. Who's up? Are you up? I'm not up. He's up. In football, the specialist comes in to kick. In baseball, the specialist comes in to relieve someone. In football, you receive a penalty. In baseball, you make an error. Whoops! Football has hitting, clipping, spearing, blocking, piling on, late hitting, unnecessary roughness, and personal fouls. Baseball has the sacrifice. Football is played in any kind of weather. Rain, sleet, snow, hail, mud. Can't read the numbers on the field, can't read the yard markers, can't read the players' numbers. The struggle will continue. In baseball, if it rains, we don't come out to play. I can't come out to play, it's raining out. Baseball has a seventh inning stretch. Football has the two minute warning. Baseball has no time limit. We don't know when it's gonna end. We might have extra innings. Football is rigidly timed and it will end even if we have to go to sudden death. In baseball, during the game in the stands, there's kind of a picnic feeling. Emotions may run high or low, but there's not that much unpleasantness. In football, in the stands, during the game, you can be sure that at least 27 times you were perfectly capable of taking the life of a fellow human being. Preferably a stranger. And finally, the objectives of the two games are totally different. In football, the object is for the quarterback, otherwise known as the field general, to be on target with his aerial assault, riddling the defense by hitting his receivers with deadly accuracy, in spite of the blitz, even if he has to use the shotgun. With short bullet passes and long bombs, he marches his troops into enemy territory, balancing this aerial assault with a sustained ground attack which punches holes in the forward wall of the enemy's defensive line. In 
In baseball, the object is to go home. And to be safe. I hope I'll be safe at home. Safe at home. Hey, baby, what's happening? Que pasa? Que what you call your pasa? Al Sleet here, your hippy dippy weather man, with all the hippy dippy weather, man. Brought to you by Parsons Pest Control. Do you have termites, water bugs, and roaches? Well, Parsons will help you get rid of the termites and water bugs and help you smoke the roaches. <laughs> Temperature at the airport is 88 degrees, which is stupid, man, because I don't know anybody who lives at the airport. Get ready to turn right. Now, if you'll take a look at our national weather map, You'll Turn see that we don't have one. <laughs> so try to picture last night's map in your mind. Remember all the letters and lines, all them little numbers. The weather is dominated by a large Canadian low, which is not to be confused with a Mexican high. <laughs> Tonight's forecast, dark. Continued dark tonight, turning to partly light in the morning. Here we are, safe and safe. Oh, well, Al, Al got out of the weather business when he realized he had given the, the final weather forecast. He had given the ultimate forecast. There was nowhere to go. You know, when there's nothing left to conquer in your field, hey, it's time to leave. And old Al had given the ultimate forecast. He told us, he said one night, that the weather will continue to change on and off for a long, long time. <laughs> And he was gone for us. God bless Al. I love that dog. I've never seen him and I love him. He's going to be wonderful when I meet that dog. <laughs> lots of people got lots of goddamn doggies. You don't even have to have one to learn about doggies. Your friend might have a dog. It could be your friend's dog. He makes you him. That makes him your dog friend. You go to visit your friend, his dog is in, you can pet him too. Hi, hello, how are you, Sneezy? You're wonderful. Hello, goddamn. And for that moment, he's your dog. So you can have someone else's dog for a while. Hi, he likes, he likes me. I think, oh my God, look at this doggy here. Goddamn doggies. Lots of things to know about him, too. Lots of things you learn. You don't know where always, and you can't remember. For instance, can you remember the first time you found out that by scratching a dog here, you could make this leg go like that? <laughs> 